Good afternoon. My name is John Strope. Welcome to History Nebraska's Brown Bag History Lecture Series. Lectures are held on the third Thursday in the Old Father Family Auditorium at the Nebraska History Museum in downtown Lincoln. Learn more about History Nebraska and our programs and services at history.nebraska.gov. If you are not a member of History Nebraska, I encourage you to join. Your support allows us to provide programs like the Brown Bag Lecture Series free for all Nebraskans. For a full list of membership benefits, visit our website. Special thanks to the Nebraska State Historical Society Foundation for the financial support which allows us to tape and broadcast these programs across the state. We'd also like to thank LNKTV, a service of the City of Lincoln, which produces these shows. If you would like to watch previous Brown Bag Lectures, visit the History Nebraska YouTube page at youtube.com slash History Nebraska and see the playlists section there. Our topic today is recent archaeology in the Sand Hills. Our speaker is Rob Bozell. Rob is the Nebraska State Archaeologist and he is a staff member with History Nebraska. A lifelong Nebraskan, Bozell received BA and MA degrees in anthropology from the University of Nebraska and has been actively involved in archaeological research and cultural resource management in Nebraska and surrounding states for 40 years. Just to let you know about asking questions, Rob prefers you wait until the end unless you are just dying to ask. Please join me in welcoming Rob Bozell. Thanks, John. I also had a, a title. My original title did have a, a colon in it, but somebody maybe <laughs> take it out. Because I'm not a university professor. But. Uh, OK, thanks a lot. I've got a, uh, in, in this presentation uh, a couple of little videos. And I've never done this before. And I don't know if they're going to work. So if they don't, bear with me. I'm still learning here. Um, OK, and I was told not to look at the screen. And, and it, it says right here, don't look at big screen, and I just did it. So I, I just have a bad habit of, <laughs> of doing that. Uh, we, we've been working, History of Nebraska has had a three-year project where we've worked out in the Sand Hills uh, doing research. We've, we've partnered with a lot of different people, and I want to credit them right up front because none of this would have happened without some of our partners. Uh, our agency, the State Archaeology Office, and the Historic Preservation Office provided funding. We work with uh, the National Park Service, Midwest Archaeological Center. I've got some nice slides of some great work they did for us out there last year. And um, we also worked with several universities. Most, most of it was the University of Nebraska-Lincoln, anthropology students, graduate and undergraduate students. We also had some students and faculty from the University of Iowa and the University of Oklahoma. So it's been a real kind of collaborative uh, project. What we're doing out there, um, other than kind of wandering around aimlessly, is try the Sand Hills is a big area, as you probably know. Uh, we're not the first archaeologists out there by any means. There's been, there's been a lot of work, but it's, there's a lot about it we just don't know. We, we just don't know a lot about it. It's a huge area, a lot of sand, a lot of grass, a lot of buried archaeology. So we wanted to kind of uh, and try to enhance our understanding of, of that region a little more than, than we already knew. And, uh, what we have done is, is looked at around 9,000 acres, where we actually walked over 9,000 acres uh, at closely spaced intervals, found, I don't have the exact number, but 175 to 200 new archaeological sites that range from 9 or 10,000 years up to early 1900s ranches and homesteads and things. Um, we kind of got off on a tangent the middle of the second year, and I'll talk more about this. One of the, the, the kinds of archaeology that's out in the sand hills are plains Apaches. And a lot of people don't know that. Who knew that Apaches lived in Nebraska? See, nobody. Well, well Stacy did, but she's heard this before. Um, a lot of people don't know that. And, and there's, they, they were out there living, uh, farm, not, not necessarily farming, but they were, had a strong presence out there. So we thought we'd take the opportunity to do some excavations at one of their villages. Uh, so we'll talk about both of those things. So it's kind of a uh, sort of a two-tiered project, survey and inventory, 
and also uh, some more intensive investigations at this Apache village. Um, we've worked in mostly in the western sand hills. Uh, those those uh, red dots are sort of where we focused our efforts. One is the one on the south end is Birdwood Creek, which is a, a Platte River tributary in the southern extreme southern margin of the sand hills. Uh, the Dismal River and Middle Loop River uh, up around Mullen area, some lake shores around Hyannis, and then last summer we spent uh, a few weeks up on the Upper Snake River, the kind of western part of the Snake River, actually quite a ways west of Merritt Reservoir and Snake River Falls, if you're familiar with that area. I know a lot of you folks have been out to the Sand Hills, so you're kind of familiar with that. Um, anyway, that's where we kind of focused our efforts. Um, we, we, as I said, we used uh, a lot of students. And here's a group of students on day one. Notice lots of white legs and they have skirts and, and uh, that, that all sort of went away after a few days. But they mostly stayed in tents. We stayed in staff members and faculty. We had rooms and, and air conditioning and TVs and they, they grumbled about that too. They grumbled a little bit. How come, how come you guys get rooms and we have to stay in tents? And we say, because we've, we stayed in tents too. So anyway. Um, they were great. They were great. And, and, and then suffered through some, you know, big rainstorms, windstorms. It's all part of learning how to be an archaeologist. It's a way to winnow out the ones that aren't really going to make it as archaeologists. If you can't spend a few weeks in a tent, then sorry, you got to go do something else. Uh, I think uh, these are really great training opportunities. It really is a kind of a win-win situation. We get lots of labor and they get really good training about ba the basics of field archaeology, how to find sites, how to record sites, how to do excavation, mapping, photography, all that stuff. And this is uh, Professor Phil Guy at the university who's shown a group of students on day one uh, just how, how we're going to proceed out there. So it really was um, uh, uh, a win-win situation. Uh, really remote areas. We, we really got out there in the middle of nowhere. I mean, literally the middle of nowhere. And, and um, oftentimes it was an hour drive to where we're working every day over roads like this. Um, and, and so it was, it was uh, pretty rough, but you know, if you want to get back there and find some of the archaeology, it's, as you, and anybody who's familiar with the Sand Hills knows, there's not a lot of roads out there. It's a lot of two tracks and it's getting around, it's kind of tough. Um, these are students on several days into it. See, they don't look quite as happy, do they? Look at them, they're kind of frowning, and they're all sweaty, and they look like they're, you know, oh boy, what have I got myself into? Uh, we worked in three different kind of settings, okay? And there's three, three sort of settings that seem to, based on previous work out there, have potential for archaeology. First is lake shores, a bunch of lakes out there. Those lakes are not man-made lakes, they're natural lakes, and they have been there off and on, Sometimes they, they dry up and sometimes they're filled with water for thousands of years. Because of the lakes and the fish in them and the birds around them and the game that go to those, they're, a, they're an attraction for people too. So, so we did a lot of, uh, we did some big surveys around several lakes uh, and found a few archeological sites um, and, and there's more there. Again, it's, stuff is deeply buried so it's kind of hard to see. Uh, streams. Uh, th this is one of my this is one of my drone videos, and, I, and I'm going to give this a shot. If 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 the whole PowerPoint thing collapses, then you're just going to have to listen to me to blather on for. They say if you just hit it, it is moving. See it? <laughs> See it? Yeah. You're not supposed to look at the screen. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. It was supposed to go away. I think. Uh, anyway. That was the Middle Loop River from, I don't know how many, a couple thousand feet in the air. Um, uh, and and as you, if you look at that, uh, you, you, I don't want to replay it because I'll end up screwing it up, but the, the, you know, rivers are kind of in size down. They're in valleys. And, and then there are dunes and terraces and hills overlooking those valleys. We spent, I'd say, 90% of our time in that environment, looking, at, looking for exposures along the river valley, okay? Um, let's try this again, I got another one. Well, that might have been it for the videos. I don't know. I don't know why that was not working. That's a really cool one too. Oh, here we go. Watch it. Watch. 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 <laughs> Those are university kids lined up out there looking. We did this very systematically. Um, they'll do anything. Go anywhere. No. Okay. Cross that river. They'll cross it. 
Um, sand hills, uh, I don't want to get into a lot of geology, but there's big dunes of sand, what they call it sand hills. And uh, one thing that I think people don't understand, I didn't really realize this to a few years ago talking to geologists, the sand hills as we know of them now, that current kind of dune configuration is not that old, five, six, seven thousand years old. And that's based on geologists coring down to the bottom of and finding, and so there is entire unknown landscapes under these vast dune fields. There's old river valleys, stream valleys, lakes that are completely invisible. And so one thing's interesting about the sand hills is that people, we talked to, we looked at some old collections and we know about old people who collected a lot in the 1950s and 30s and they're finding great collections of artifacts miles away from streams and rivers. I think what's happening is that there's a whole different landscape out there. So it's a particularly challenging environment, uh, the, uh, unique to, to, to in Nebraska, where you got, you pretty much the rest of Nebraska, you can, the landscape you're looking at it's pretty similar to the way it's been for a long time. Sand hills, there's a whole other landscape underneath it. So, so we'd look at some of these dunes. There's not going to be much archaeology in the dunes, but we try to look at what's underneath them. We tried to find places where we could look underneath them through exposures like this. The other, and, and, and as I mentioned, these blowouts. Again, a lot of them in the 1930s and 50s when it was really dry where huge tracks were blown out. And they would blow down to these old surfaces and people would just get bucket loads of Folsom points and Clovis points and really old, old material. Um, just a few pictures. This is a blowout, small blowout. The kids looking, I think there actually was a site there, a few pieces of flint and a uh, little animal bone fragments. So we would look at those. We'd kind of go to those, we'd see those, we'd go to them, we'd look, use some aerial maps to try to find them and also when we were walking around and seeing a blowout, we would go to those. Another video. This one's, this one's good. Ah, look how excited she is. Well, watch this. I found something. I think she's saying, I found something. Um, uh, we're doing a few videos on archaeology, and these are little clips. I'm just kind of showing off. Um, <coughs> streams. Spent a lot of time on stream valleys, uh, as I said before. Um, and, you know, there's a lot of grass out there, as you know. And when you've got a lot of grass, there's really no way to see the surface. So, so we, we would try to target er eroded areas uh, like this. In fact, this one, I'm just simply going to have to turn around because I can't contain myself. But if you see up in that hill, there's some dark bands. I don't know if you guys can see them. And there's a whole scatter of animal bone and flint and stone tools kind of scattered all over there. Those are all eroding out of that bank. If that was all grass over, there's no way we'd see it. We probably walked over five times more sites than we actually found. I mean, I'm serious. You walk over, like, there's no way to see them. So we would really kind of focus on these eroded areas. And that, and that, that slide's a good one, because you can kind of see a lot of eroded areas. That's on the Snake River, up the Snake River, out in extreme western Cherry County, right? Yeah. Um, so when you get areas like that, we got these buried soils and erosion. Uh, that's where we're finding, finding the archaeology. Uh, when I, we were, we found a lot of Native American sites that go back 9,000 years up to the 1600s. But that wasn't all we were looking for. We also wanted to explore the archaeology of ranching, homesteading, some of that really early stuff. And, and we found them. And a lot of this was the landowners telling us, you know, well, I know where this old homestead is, and this is, um, one of our uh, historic architects recording, helping us record with one of the students. That's Abby Luann. Right? And also had a landowner tell us about Saudis. And there was a kind of a good one. It's not, it's probably beyond the fixer upper stage or the flip this house, but uh, there's not many Saudis left. I, uh, a woman in, in our office, Diane Lafine, is working with another fellow, David Murphy, on trying to record the, exi the remaining sod houses in, in Nebraska. I think she said there's maybe a hundred, but it's actually more than I thought. I, I don't know. I, there, there's not a lot. You know, there, there were many hundreds. There may be a hundred left. This is one we didn't know about, but that, and the landowner told us about it. Um, and so Diane went and spent, spent a whole day there recording some great architectural information about how the sod, the, the little wall, she measured everything, took a ton of pictures. So it wasn't really just buried archaeology. We came across stuff, the early homesteading, ranching. Uh, we recorded that too. 
uh, which was kind of interesting. It's not, it's not something that we really planned on, but it presented itself, and it was a lot of fun. Um, we also worked, uh, uh, did a little bit of geomorphology, and that gets, I'm not going to get too technical, but we worked with a fellow we worked with for years, Rolf Mandel at the University of Kansas, who's a, a really well-known ge geologist, but he, he does most of his work with, with archaeology, trying to use geology to figure out about where archaeological sites are. So Rolf came out, we're going to go out with him again uh, one more time here next month, um, and we looked at, at buried soils, okay, because those buried soils, when you see that, you've all seen that in a creek bank or a road cut where you've got these stacked soils, what those dark bands are are periods in the past where it was a stable climate and a good time for people to, to live on it, okay. The yellow material is usually windblown or flooding or something that's less favorable. That's usually where you get these stable surfaces and things get preserved. So we had Rolf out and, and looked at some of these exposures, did some radiocarbon dating, how old they are, and whether they had any cultural material to help us kind of develop this picture of, of where archaeology exists and is well preserved out there, because you only get these little glimpses of it. Uh, that's another example. You can see the crew sort of sitting up at the top of that hill. That's a little two track that cuts down through this terrace, uh, and there's artifacts uh, littered up and down that, that little trail. And at the very bottom, if you see on that side, your left, I'm not sure what direction, but that side, uh, there's a big dark band down there. That, based on some other work in the area, that may be eight or, eight or 9,000 years old, uh, that soil down there. And in the next canyon over, uh, wait, next slide, let me, let, me go, let me do this and see if I can go back. That's going to be a real challenge. Uh, that is about a 9,000 year old spear point and it, and it came out of what looked like a soil like that. So we were able to kind of associate different styles of artifacts with these buried soils so we can kind of catalog this and know where to look in the future for future archaeologists. That's uh, Rolf over there on the right and, and uh, Courtney Ziska in our office and Phil Guy from the university recording these soils. So we would record these, he would take samples, we'd get radiocarbon dates on them. And this, this I think, exposure had some of the older material, eight, seven, eight thousand years old, right Courtney, wasn't it? Yeah. Uh, it didn't have any archaeology in it, but we know we now have a target, so we can look in other parts of that valley for these kind of soils, okay? There's that one again. And uh, as I said, we found Native American material really from the whole span of as long as people lived out there, from about 10,000 years. We, we didn't find any Clovis or Folsom points, which is the oldest, but we got late Paleo-Indian, uh, all the way up through uh, kind of late pre-contact, 1600s. One thing I don't think we found any of, I don't think we found any po post-contact sites like Lakota or Cheyenne or any trade beads or metal, did, did we, Courtney? One site, maybe. Maybe one site, you know. The thing is, uh, those people are really only out there that, when you think of Plains Indians, particularly on the west, you think of the Sioux, Lakota, Cheyenne, they weren't there that long, maybe a hundred years, and, and they were always in the move. So they, they, because they were such a nomadic people, even though there was a lot of them, there weren't, a, there weren't great concentrations of people living in some place for a long time where you can actually get an archaeological site to form and be buried. So they're out there, but they have a, they have a, a really, uh, not a very visible archaeology out there. Some of the later material we found was uh, Central Plain tradition. This is a, one of our uh, landowners had found these points and made earrings out of them. Um, I think they're kind of nice, actually. But, um, Anyway, um, so the full range, uh, you know, uh, kind of that whole, that whole period, uh, you know, that whole about 9,000 years. So there's a lot of people living out there. That's a long time. And, and again, we just got a tiny glimpse of what's out there, just a tiny glimpse. But it was, it was tantalizing. You know, it really is. Um, the other thing where we really focused last summer and, and a few weeks, well, mostly this summer, a little bit last summer, was I mentioned Plains Apaches, okay? something that people don't know about, so that's always kind of fun to talk about because a lot of people, that's, that's news to, new to them. Um, who's this? Geronimo. Good. Geronimo. Uh, Geronimo wasn't in the Sand Hills, as far as we know. Because I think when people think about the Apaches, they think about the, you know, the Indian War period and the historic period, and Apaches lived in the Southwest, and that's where they always lived, and Geronimo is certainly a very famous personality. Uh, this is a little earlier. The Apaches are actually not indigenous to, to the southern plains or the southwest. 
they, they, not at all. Their homeland is the Arctic. Believe it or not, that's their. They speak a, a, a language group called Athabascan, and they and their relatives, the Navajos, are also not indigenous to the Southwest. Don't want to get off on a tangent here, but those people slowly migrated for whatever reason out of the Arctic, subarctic, southward, starting maybe 1200. 1300 AD, you know, and, and moving down into the Rockies and the Great Basin, and eventually wound up in the Southwest, okay, over the, over the course of several hundred years. At some point, either they were down there and came back, or maybe on their way down there, they occupied uh, a vast area of the Central Plains. That, that big, I'm hearing a lot of hmm, that's good. That's, I like hmm, that's good. Um, that big gray area, that's where they lived. And they lived uh, in that area from probably maybe the late 1500s up to the early mid 1700s, a couple hundred years, maybe even longer. We're not quite sure, but certainly there seems to be a, a lot of activity in the 1600s. And, and uh, they're probably very different than what we know of as the Apaches during the Indian War period, okay? Um, they, at least for what we can tell, they didn't have any horses, they had dogs, they had a lot of dogs, so they carried stuff around, um, and and they were semi-nomadic. They weren't they weren't really wandering around like the Lakota and Cheyenne. They were building they were nomadic, but they were also building villages and little towns. And we actually we worked on one of those little towns, and uh, it's called the Humphrey site, and it's right outside of Mullen, Nebraska. It uh, is not was not new. We, we actually had been found in the 1940s. History of Nebraska did some work out there in 1949, so we knew about it, but we wanted to see if it was still intact, and if so, do some more excavations there, okay? And let me check my time. I don't want to blather too much. Oh, we're doing good. 40 more minutes. I can slow down a little bit. Okay. Uh, that actually is a photograph. The black and white photograph was taken in 1949. The, the color photograph was taken a couple of years ago. We knew about where it was, but actually it was wrong in the map. So we kind of used to really narrow it down that photograph. And again, I hate to turn around, but I have to. If you look at some of those big exposures, those white eroded areas in 1949, they're the same as that. And the site's actually right in front of that little tree line there. So we kind of use that and also landowners. Landowners have been great to tell us, yeah, I think it was there where they dug. In fact, the lady who owns it said, said that she knew kind of where it was and we verified it. So, so it's, it was not a new site, but we wanted to bring to bear new techniques, new ideas, new research into these Plains Apaches. The first thing we did for the good graces of our friends across the street at the National Park Service, Midwest Archaeological Center, uh, we uh, sat in trucks while they bundled up in the very cold weather and did ground penetrating radar and magnetometer. And they, these are what's called remote sensing, geophysical stuff where there are these fancy machines and they can kind of look underneath the ground and look for differences in the soil and compaction and a bunch of other stuff that I don't really understand, but others do, and tell you where there may be buried archaeology, okay? This is a ground penetrating radar thing, and they go over this area in, in a closely spaced grid, it's like one meter, and it collects data, and it makes magic maps. And there's a magic map, okay? I gotta turn around a little bit. Uh, I just, I, anyway. Uh, each one of those little tiny squares is a meter to get, to, to get some sense of, of, it's a pretty big area, okay? And all the little dark blobs some of those could be archaeological, but a lot of them are probably modern metal, like nails and beer cans, and probably beer cans from the archaeologists in 1949. But, um, but those three big circles with the red through them, the, 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 the person who was doing that said, those really look like they're buried structures of some kind. Again, these are 400 years old. The structure's gone. There's nothing standing. But he said those, it had characteristics that were very likely to be some kind of buried archaeological features, houses, lodges, whatever. More, more than substantial than a teepee. Uh, so we had targets. In fact, those red lines are sort of where we did our excavations the last couple years, which is what I'll sort of talk about here for a while. 
we, we did these tr excavated controlled trenches through those three big, and those, those round things are about 20 feet in diameter, maybe 20, I don't know, something like that, 20, 25 feet um, circular. And as we excavated through that, it was exactly what he kind of had predicted. There was just a, a really dense layer of, of charred timbers, burn material, all collapsed. These are kind of a dome-shaped house. I'll show you kind of an example what we think they might have looked like. It all collapsed in, probably burned, I mean obviously burned, and all that timber and charcoal is all left preserved on the floor like that. Uh, and it got buried over from flooding and slope erosion from nearby dunes and that kind of thing. Uh, very well preserved. Um, uh, another kind of close-up of it. And, and so we take, uh, you know, take real detailed notes, draw everything, uh, draw the, the floor, of draw every single log. It's kind of time consuming, but we want to be able to reconstruct the architecture for one thing. Um, example, one of our drawings. And uh, take detailed notes, measure all these pieces of timber so we can kind of reconstruct what's going on. Um, in fact, that piece, I'm not sure, but it almost looked like it was kind of flat on one side, like they might have been splitting these things, more like a log than, a, than just taking raw timber. We'll have to sort of see that, but it's almost like they were hewn, okay? Uh, that's the, the trenches through the three lodges, okay? Um, and uh, you can see they're all pretty well preserved. If you look in that middle one, uh, in kind of the middle part of it, there, there's like kind of light soil. It looks like they were bringing in some kind of clay mixed with, I don't know, water, or, and it gets sandy, but it's like it just slathered across the floor, maybe to make it like a hard floor, a prepared floor. Um, and, and so that'll tell us a little bit about how they built those things. So it was really pretty, welcome, pretty remarkably well preserved. In and laying on that floor were a lot of artifacts, animal bone, uh, stone tools, flint from making stone tools, pottery fragments, you know, lots of charcoal, and, and we recovered that all pretty closely. We don't know what these houses look like, but remember that uh, I'd said the Apaches and, and Navajos are related semi-distantly, okay? I don't know whether they can speak with each other, but they're in the same language family, and they have kind of a shared heritage. This is a not modern Navajo house. Uh, I think they might look something like this. We don't know. That was you, okay. Um, we don't really know yet. Hopefully we will. Uh, but again, I want to stress they're not teepees. They're something more substantial. It's a prepared floor. There's posts. There's rafters and the roof. What it was covered with, I don't know. I hate, I hate to use the word earth lodge, which is a plain thing. There's not a lot of earth out there. I, I don't know how you could build an earth lodge with, the, with how much sand there is. They could be covered, you know, they could have been making this kind of clay stuff, which we did get some burn clay, what we call daub, a little bit of that. They could be hide covered thatch. I, we don't know. We may not know exactly, but we got a lot more architectural information the last couple years that we had before about these Plains Apaches houses. So uh, stay tuned and hopefully we can kind of figure out what they look like. Let's break up the monotony with a couple of videos, shall we? This is another one. Uh, you can see the site's that kind of whole area. It's not the whole shot, but we're really digging just a very small portion of it. Archaeology now, that, those are the squares we dug. When I see them, some of the squares aren't exactly lined up, which makes me nervous. They're supposed to be perfect, but they're not. Um, they, uh, you know, in archaeology today, because so many sites are dwindling, you know, from construction and erosion and farming and all kinds of reasons, we don't want to completely excavate a site. We don't have the time, we don't have the money. So we just want to be really careful about sampling to get specific kinds of information. That's why that ground penetrating tra 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 radar was pretty good. So you see that thing, we only dug, I don't know, 20, 30 squares, maybe 40. I don't know. Um, in addition to the houses, uh, there were some, some pits some that, that, where, where the folks that lived there would dig these pits, maybe to store stuff, certainly to throw trash in. This is one that had, was filled with trash, animal, mostly bison bone, uh, broken pots, broken pot fragments, broken stone tools, a lot of charcoal, a lot of ash from cleaning out the fireplace. This was actually just outside the house. 
The other thing, when we were doing all this kind of detailed drawing and mapping that kind of became apparent, and we'll have to sort of figure this out, this thing may have been reoccupied a couple times, okay? We know of at least those three and, and two other houses, may, maybe a sixth. Um, each one might have had, you know, 10, 15 people living, a family or a small extended family. So it's not like a big community, but, but th there's a little bit of evidence of, of some, some reuse of it. Maybe they'd live there for a few years, go away, come back, different people come back. Um, anyway, uh, yeah, got these, the, and these, these pits that were filled with, uh, with trash. Watch this. Watch what she turns over. <gasps> turtle shell. Had a lot of, we had a lot of bison bone, but also a lot of turtle. Um, that seems to be the preferred menu, buffalo and turtle. Uh, but there was uh, deer, antelope, a little bit of dog, a little bit of bird, maybe a little tiny bit of fish, but hardly any, which kind of surprised me. They're right on the river, but they don't seem to be fishing. Um, mussel shell? I don't think we had any mussel shell. Is there a little bit of mussel shell? So very rare. Uh, bison, big deal. Turtles, don't know why. Um, I've never had turtle soup, but maybe I will. Experimental archaeology has some turtle soup. Okay. Uh, this was a kind of a particularly interesting feature. These are rare, okay? And, 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 you, and you can't go look for them. You just have to stumble on them. I don't know how many there are in Nebraska, maybe dozens. Uh, a, a actual cache where they would, would hide away, maybe not hide away, but some items to come back and retrieve. And it's a little feature this big. And we were working on it. We noticed there was this little concentration of these end scrapers. End scrapers are used to process hides, scrape the deer and the grease, and, uh, the, the hair and the grease off of hides to make them into, you know, whatever you're going to do. And there were a little cache of these, these scrapers. And uh, there, that is as it was being exposed, that little tiny hole there in the bottom, they were all just stuffed in there. Like they stuffed them in there to come back and retrieve them, although they never did. There was, I think, 13 or 14 of them all together uh, laying down in there, which was kind of neat. That's, that's actually rare. I don't know how many there are in Nebraska, but not, not very many, not very many. Um, okay, a little more about kind of our field methods out there, which is why things are different than 1949. 1949, uh, there was a technique that was not even invented yet called screening, where we take the dirt and we screen it through different size screens. They didn't do that back then. They just used shovels and got the cool stuff and put them in their truck. And I mean, you know, so you get, so in these older collections from the 1930s and 40s and 50s are kind of inherently biased to the bigger items. You don't get a bunch of little material. So we, we took a lot of time uh, fine screening all that dirt we got, all of that sand. And uh, there's a couple students screening it. Um, we also did some uh, what's called water screening where we would take the soil and put it in these boxes and it's lined with like real fine screen like window mesh the size of a you know window screen and wash it through that boy when you do that compared to what they did in the 40s the, the number of artifacts really I mean it, it, you get a much better picture of of what they had okay uh, small bones, lots of tiny little pieces of flint, which can tell you a lot about their technology, how they, how they made tools, how they, uh, um, how they manufactured them, how they resharpened them. Uh, so you get a much, much better recovery. We'll have an ethnobotanist look at, we got a whole bunch of charcoal and there may be seeds in there, there may be corn, I don't know, she's looking at it now. There's no way you would get that kind of stuff without, again, this is not a technique we've we have invented by any means. Everybody in the world does it now, archaeologists. But I don't know that there's been any done on these Plains Apache sites. So we're hoping it'll give us maybe some new perspectives that we didn't know. Okay? Uh, how old is it? How old is that site? Well, we, we've got some radiocarbon dates. You can take bone and charcoal, and, and you can get a radiocarbon date. And that date is not going to give you the exact year. It, it's going to have a little bit of a range in it. And sometimes you got to do some statistics and, and kind of factor out some things. And without going into nauseatingly boring detail about that, I'll tell you that the, the dates that we think that that site was occupied is probably right in the middle 1600s. 
Uh, there's a couple of options with our radiocarbon dates, but one is like between 1750 and 1800. I don't like that because there's not one single trade good, not one. If this site really dated to 1750, there ought to be trade beads, there ought to be get some metal, copper, brass. Uh, there's not one. Uh, it, it, there's not one single trade item. So it really kind of leaves us with this other sort of, and actually that's that blue, there's those blue up and down bars. Uh, 1630, 1640, 1650, somewhere in there. So it's, there's contact out here, but there's not much. So these people are clearly not in any kind of regular contact. There might be, you know, by 1700, there's a few French fur traders. Certainly they're maybe aware of the Spanish in the Southwest, but boy, there's, they don't have, they're not bringing up trade goods. Um, got, got quite a few artifacts. It wasn't abundant, but got a really nice sample of, of kind of everything. Um, ceramics, they made a lot of pottery out there. Again, that's different than the Lakota and the, and, uh, and the Cheyenne and some others you think about there. They're making pots. So presumably they're, they're storing water, they're storing food, they're cooking in them. We know they're cooking in them. Uh, th we may be able to get some residue off the inside. There's a lot of those residue on the inside of the pots. We can scrape that off, figure out, use it for dating, and also figure out what it is they're cooking in these things. So. It's a kind of a sedentary people. They're living there. It's a village. It's not like a little uh, teepee camp. Uh, quite a bit of stone, tools, um, arrowheads, scrapers, knives, sort of the usual suspects. But one thing that's kind of interesting is uh, there is no chippable flint in the sand hills. It doesn't exist out there. There just are no geologic deposits. Everything, all the flint that you need, which is the most important commodity they have other than food, you got to bring from elsewhere, okay? You got to bring it in with you. That's probably why that little catcher scrapers was there. These are valuable things. They're going to hide them away for when they come back next time. They obviously didn't. Um, but the stone, based on the color and the type of stone and some other characteristics, we can tell where it came from. And and most of it's coming from the Republican River Valley or Wyoming or Northeast Colorado or Western Nebraska. So we can look at that stone and know where they were at, where they were going out hunting, you know, where, where some other areas there are, so we can start to stitch together, you know, a story about their mobility and their patterns and where they went and why. And so the stone, it's not just about, um, <clears throat> not just about the technology, but also the, where they're getting their rock, okay? Uh, bone, you know, a lot of bones, I said, uh, but a lot of, some bone tools too. That thing on the top is a, uh, Buffalo rib and the hole in it was drilled and it's used for making arrow shafts, to straighten out arrow shafts, arrow shaft straightener. Some of those little things down there, those little uh, kind of cream colored things are bone awls for sewing, perforating leather, or making teepees or you know whatever, uh, hide working. Uh, there's a nice drill down there. I think that T-shaped thing is a drill, a stone drill. Um, so we've got a pretty good assortment of artifacts. And, and again, I think from that fine screening, it's going to be different than what we had in the 40s. This is not from our excavation, but this is a typical Plains Apache pot. This is from another site, also in the 30s or 40s. Uh, we didn't find any complete pots. We will glue together what we got, but we don't have any complete vessels. But this is, this is what the pots look like. Pretty plain, you know, not a lot of decoration on them, pretty utilitarian, but they were dirt, certainly ceramic making people. I think by the time Geronimo was around and, the, and kind of the historic period uh, Apaches, they, had, they weren't doing any of this anymore. They had all, they were completely equipped with trade goods, horses, guns, metal, glass, there was none of this. So this is a good way to kind of look at their technology prior to sustained European contact. Uh, we also had the opportunity to, um, th there was a, from this site and some others, some pieces of obsidian. We know what obsidian is? comes out of volcanoes. There's no volcanoes in Nebraska. It shoots out, it, when, it, when it cools, it's glass. It looks like glass because it is glass. Black, brown, and it's really high quality for making arrowheads and scrapers and knives and stuff. A little bit of obsidian out here. And so we were able to work with somebody who can take the, the composition, the, the chemistry of these little tiny pieces of obsidian and figure out where they came from. And it's not all from one place. They're all over the place. It comes from Yellowstone, uh, Idaho, Nevada, the Southwest. Uh, so they're, they're, it, again, it, it, it kind of makes it a, even a more complex picture. These people are all over the place and they're associated with a lot of people. So it's, these are just little bits of evidence that um, kind of stitch together this, this story here. 
And uh, I want to kind of talk a little bit about our relationship with the people in the Sand Hills today. Another, just like with the students, we couldn't have done it. Couldn't have done it without them. And, and one thing that's nice about working in the Sand Hills as opposed to working in eastern Nebraska when you're trying to get landowner permission, around here you got you know, 60 acres, 180, you know, a couple hundred acres. People own tens of thousands of acres out there. So, which was great. Uh, once you get on their good side, uh, and get permission, uh, it's great because uh, not only, you know, I think we probably dealt with six or eight families all together, um, big, big ranches. Once you kind of earn their trust, man, then it's, it's great. Uh, they, you know, they will uh, not only uh, let us work on their land, but they know that land pretty well. They know where they find arrowheads. They know where that Saudi is. They know where the old homesteads are. They have the stories. So a lot of what we learned was not necessarily us just out wandering around aimlessly. It was learning from these people. This is one of the families that put us up. That's where the tents were. Again, us old people got to stay in rooms and the kids stayed in tents outside. Eh. Uh, but they did feed us. They got, the kids got to come inside to eat, but then they had to go back out again. <laughs> go back to your tent. I think one night we had a big rain, big rain, like the first couple nights and a couple of students came in and camped on our floor and they never left. They just stayed there. They didn't <laughs> just need to go to your tents. Mm, I don't feel good. A um, couple other ranchers, just another family that we work with very closely, a, a mother and a son, a big family out there, uh, and one of our archaeologists out there. I mean, the people were just really gracious. And I mean, it was really great, uh, the, the amount of information that they were able to tell us. Um, my friend Jim Cavanaugh in Omaha said I, if, that if I put a picture of him in the talk, he would come. So I had to bribe him. To, anyway, that's, that's one of a, uh, that fellow there with the floppy hat. Um, he, he's got his sisters out there. She's a doctor, and her husband is a doctor in Mullen. If you're ever out in an area, hook up with the doctors because they got everybody's cell phone number for emergency contacts. These people are hard to get a hold of, and, and it was great because because Kavanaugh's sister had everybody's cell phone number and it was great and it helped a lot with the thing out there everybody knows each other and and so we, you know we want to try to find well who owns this land and well you need to call this guy or call this woman or maybe you could find them at the bar that's where they are go and find them there and, and you know it was, so it was a, real, a lot of a lot of networking in it but it made it it made it pleasurable and it made it a real success okay um, they also loaned us their equipment. Uh, this is a fire truck. Everybody out there has a fire truck. Everybody's got a fire truck for prairie fires and grass fires. And um, before we were screening in the in the in the river, we we were water screening that fine screening through. Um, uh, use this water truck, fill it with water, and use it. It worked great. You know. In fact, we were talking about. Well, we're gonna have to put these pumps, and she said, No, we'll just bring our fire truck out. You can have our fire <laughs> truck. Uh, so it worked great. And, and, and then if you really are nice to these people, they'll invite you over for dinner and you get lots of hamburgers and brats and beer. And anyway, it was great, it was great. Um, now, got a few minutes left. I'll, I'll talk for another five minutes or so and then we'll take questions. I'm running a little early, I hope you got a lot of questions. John said if you don't have questions, I have to blather on more. So it, I can, who knows what I'll talk about. But um, what are we learning? This is, <laughs> this is our colleague, Phil Guy. He's not here, so I thought, it's a great picture. The, the, the ponder. I'm going to send it to him and say, here's the ponder. Anyway, um, what are we learning? Okay, uh, why do we do this? And I've kind of alluded to a lot of this, you know, through, through the talk, but I wanted to kind of go over it again. And okay. um, Certainly we have, a, we have and we're going to have. Our report, we're going to write a report on this, which is due in about a year. So I don't have all the facts yet, but here's what we hope to have in that report. We're going to have a much clearer understanding of where to find archaeology out there based on our surface surveys, based on working with Rolf Mandel, looking at these buried soils, based on talking to landowners, all that stuff. We're not going to know everything by any means. Well, the more you go out there, you realize, like with any kind of good research project, the more you do it, the more you realize how little you know and have, have new questions. So, but I think we're going to be in a little bit better position. This project was partially funded um, by our Historic Preservation Office, and they have a vested interest in this because that office, they uh, do a lot of work with government agencies who are developing things, and they need to help understand where the archaeology is. 
example one, example two. Well, I'll give you two examples. The R line, there's a transmission line that's going through the southern sand hills, very controversial. Got people real divided, and, and it's, a, you know, and a, people are really upset about it. And they got to consider a lot of environmental things, just like pipelines, you know, Trans Canada, it's the same sort of thing. Um, and so this will allow our Historic Preservation Office and other government agencies to kind of better understand what's out there and what they ought to be concerned with, okay? So that, that it helps, it's not just archaea, it's not just research, it's also uh, to help with compliance with, with state and federal historic preservation laws. Wind farms is a big deal. Boy, is it a big deal out there. It's a big deal out there. And, and people are really divided. In fact, we were told as we're eating burgers and drinking beer and brats and hanging out with all these people, th there's some hard feelings about that and it's divided people out there. Uh, so, you know, this is a small part of that, but I think that, you know, one of the considerations of wind farms and transmission lines and pipelines and all this stuff is the impact on the cultural environment, not, not just the natural environment. So it, you know, this will help with that a little bit too. Um, we, now, we knew, but now we have a, a clear understanding that people have been out there for 10,000 years, okay? Um, and we know what the challenges are. It's hard to find stuff out there. It's hard, particularly if, yellow, if it's a wet season, they're just, I mean, you, you can't see under the grass and you can't do ground penetrating radar over 9,000 acres. Um, so, you know, we, we know some challenge, we know sort of what, what wind to go out there in the year, kind of places to look. Uh, you know, some of it's counterintuitive, but it's helped sort of solidify some of that stuff. And then specifically with this Plains Apache research, I think we're gonna, we're, we're, as I mentioned, we're gonna be able to have a lot of new information. Architecture, subsistence, you know, hunting, technology, where they're getting their rocks, the chronology. It, it'll really help us enhance our understanding of Plains Apaches, because it's a story, the Plains Apache story in Nebraska is not one that very many people know. I mean, they don't. Who knew about that before? Me? You, you came in. You, it's because I told you all this. <laughs> um, uh, this is our, you know, the obligatory crew picture. This was from last summer. Happy, happy, they're happy, they're happy kids. And, and, and my favorite, this was, that was the last day this year and this picture was taken day one in 2016. A little red fox pup poking his head out. It's just, yeah, anyway. Um, uh, I think, I think it's now 10 minutes till. So we have, John says eight minutes. He's making hand signals. I don't know what he's saying. <laughs> We've got some minutes for questions. And, and, and so please ask them. Cassie. I have a good question. I, I don't care if it's good, I just don't want it to be hard. It, it won't be. Do we have any idea yet if they're traveling to procure their lipids or are they trading to procure their lipids? No, not for sure. Her, her, oh yeah, I gotta repeat the question. Her question was, are, when these people are going to Colorado and Wyoming and the southern Nebraska to get their rocks, are they trading it or are they going there? I don't know. They, you have a sense these are pretty mobile people. It's probably some combination of both. I, I think that they're, they're around all. I think, you know, with, you think about people, horses and cars, you move around. People walked, but they did it. I mean, you, you know, so, so I, don't, I don't know the answer. I would imagine it's a bit of both. It's a bit of both, yeah. Yes, ma'am. The charcoal with the Humphrey site, yes. is that from prairie fires, or do we know? Uh, she asked about the charcoal at the Humphrey site. Is it from prairie fires? No, most of it is, is those burned timbers, okay? So, so those, those logs I was showing you on the floor, that's part of the house, the superstructure. So our, our samples of charcoal that we use for radiocarbon dating are, are coming in little pieces off those logs that were part of their walls and roof. Now there's no, there, you think, well, the Sandoz doesn't have any trees. Well, it does, and, but it's, they're right down in the stream valleys, you know? Certainly the dunes, are, you're not getting them, but they're, but they're getting trees. Uh, we actually, some of the trees we were able to identify and uh, the radiocarbon lab did it. It's uh, cedar, red cedar, which people think red cedar is invasive. It, it is invasive, but it's been around a while. It's also native to, the, to central Nebraska. And I think the other one was ash. I think we had some ash. 
uh, and maybe elm and stuff. So the charcoal we're getting is from it. Now, how did the houses burn down, which is a kind of a related question. Why are they all burned? Which may be really in front of your question. Don't know. Some tribes and some people have kind of a, some, some feelings about when you leave a place, you should burn it down. Or if someone died in there, you should burn it down. I know the Navajos do, and these are kind of related to Navajos. Uh, typically, we've worked on a lot of, of Native American houses in Nebraska over the years. Not just these people, but ancestors of the Pawnees and Omahas and, you know, in eastern Nebraska. I would say 90% of them are burned, okay? Uh, whether it's intentionally or by accident. But even if they're abandoned and you, you leave and you do the house and you move, eventually, you know, lightning strike or prairie fires. I think, you know, prairie fires are common, you know, and, and from probably back then, really from lightning. I mean, the only way to start them. So we don't know, but it could have been a prairie fire burned them all or they were intentionally burned. We don't have any evidence of warfare. There could be, but we don't have any evidence of any violence there at that site. Jim, you had a question. The uh, Plains Apache folks, um, how long were they there and when and why did they leave? Do we know? Yeah, Jim asked uh, the Apaches, how, how long were they there in the sand hills? Or, yeah. yeah, and why did they leave? You guys are asking me questions I don't, I, I don't have really answers to. I think that they're certainly gone by the early 1700s. There's a couple sites on the Republican River that seem to have some trade goods, maybe 1750. The earliest sites, I, it seems like it's kind of a 1600s, early 1700s, maybe late 1500s. So it's 150 to 200 years when they're out there. And, and, and it's the Sand Hills, it's the Panhandle, Northwest Kansas, Northeast Colorado. It's a, that big area, that big gray area I was showing you. Um, why did they leave? Uh, I can, uh, I, I love saying it. One thing great about archaeology, you just make this stuff up because nobody can prove you wrong. So I'm just making <laughs> stuff up. Although I think there's a little truth to it. There's some uh, ethno-historic and ethnographic and historic um, evidence by the Pawnees that they're somebody out west and, and they're in their territory and they call them the Padukas. I don't know what Paducah means, but, but it's not the Kentucky. Actually, the Kentucky town is named after. It is. I looked it up. I know. Yeah. Um, uh, the Pawnee, it could be conflict. There's certainly some interaction with the Pawnees, and, and there is some Pawnee uh, oral history about warfare with the Padukas out west. And it's, it's almost through, through process of elimination, it's got to be these folks. So it could be they were driven out by the Pawnees who were already here and had been here for a long time. That's not their homeland. Their homeland is kind of central Nebraska, but that's certainly their hunting territory. So it could be competition. Uh, don't, don't know. The one thing that's kind of interesting and that we talked about is out there, just kind of musing, is, you know, were these Apaches already in the Southwest and somehow maybe from a, getting away from the Spanish, moved back up into the Central Plains and, and then went back down? That could be. That was generally the kind of the, thought, the theory was that these people actually had already got to New Mexico and then they moved up into the Plains maybe with conflicts with the Spanish or the Pueblos or, you know, somebody else. One thing that's a little puzzling about that, you, you don't get any painted pottery, you know, polychrome, and anything that's civilly southwestern. It's, I mean, they may have certainly a familiarity with the southwest. It's not like they were living there and familiar with Pueblo pottery and painted pottery. You don't, I mean, there's like one piece, I think, from western Nebraska. It's, um, anyway, it, it's, a, it's a complex question, and that was not a very good answer, but, you know. We got a few more minutes. Thank you. Yes, please. Did you locate any human bones or grave nope. sites? Nope, not one. We talked about that a lot uh, uh, when we were out there. And I think there's only one. Oh, yes. <laughs> he asked, did we locate any uh, human remains, any human bones or burials? Uh, no, we did not. And in fact, even on all these other Plains Apache sites from the 40s in Kansas, I don't think there's any burials. There might be one. I think a fellow was out there said there might be one or two from Kansas, which is really kind of puzzling because, you know, with earlier, you know, pre-contact people and Pawnees and Omahas, there's big cemeteries. There isn't any. It may have to do with their mortuary practices. Uh, the Navajo, I don't know much about the Apaches. We've actually reached out to them and would like to engage them a little more. We have not heard from them. We'd like to engage them and maybe talk to them and have them come up. 
But the Navajos uh, have a real, you know, real serious feeling about the dead. You don't deal with the dead. And they might have put people on scaffolds as opposed to burying them. And if you put somebody on a scaffold, it's not going to preserve. It's going to, you know, it's just going to, it's going to be dust to dust. But no, there are very few, and we didn't find any of it, any of it. But good question, because it is something that's a little puzzling. Yes, sir. Um, we have a family member up at Valentine who's a very good point hunter that has found all kinds of things up there over the years. And he was telling me that on the top of those knobs along the Niobrara, they each found these tripping sites and, and uh, was speculating on why they would go up on top of a hill to do that. And his theory is that they did it to get away from mosquitoes. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. And, and actually, uh, his question was uh, up, up on the Niobrara, kind of a little bit northwest of where we're working around the Valentine area. I uh, said there's a lot of little hilltops overlooking the Niobrara Valley with little bits of flint chips. And he, and he said that the, kind of the, some of the lore was that they'd get up there to get away from the mosquitoes. I don't know. Um, I've heard that. Uh, and actually, uh, when I was much younger, we worked on, uh, and I was a student at the university, worked on, some will remember, there was the Norden Dam. Remember the Norden Dam they were going to build and never built it? Uh, we did a bunch of archaeology up there, and you're right. Every single hilltop, every single hilltop had a little scatter of mostly the same kind of rock, this rock that actually occurs up there. Uh, you know, I don't think we're really going to know. Certainly, people are always interested in looking for game. That's another thing I've heard. They're game watching. You know, if you're going to be sitting around, you know, you're getting hungry, uh, food's running low, and you're going to retool up, fix your stone tools, going up on top of a hill to see the valley, see if there's any buffalo herds coming, you know, I don't know. Particularly, also, if you've got enemies, you kind of want to see, but yeah, it could be mosquitoes, could be defensive. Another non-answer answer, but great question, and, and we have asked that question before. we got maybe a couple of minutes. Yeah, no, no, no. go ahead. Well, really big backhoes. <laughs> uh, oh yeah, repeat it. Okay, I'm really sorry. Um, her question was, in the future, can we find a way to get down through those dunes? I don't know if there's ever going to be like ground penetrating radar kind of stuff where you can do that. Although there's things that we're doing now that you never thought of, like DNA. I mean, who thought of that 20 years ago? Um, uh, so I don't know. I think that, that, that the little bit of geology we know is they do cores. I mean, that's how we know. Jim Swinert at the university did cores down there and, and got to those old soils. So you can core down, you can core real deep, you know, drill down there and at least get an idea of how deep these old surfaces are and what kind of potential they have. Um, I think the best way is to try to find them in profile. That's why the river valleys that cut through them are great. Yes, ma'am. Well, uh, good question. She asked what has irrigation done to the archaeology. There's not a whole lot of irrigation out there, but there is in the valleys. Irrigation doesn't affect it unless you have to land level. Well, you see a lot of that where, where in order to put in a center pivot, you want to get it leveled, and sometimes you have to just completely level it out. You've got a shallow site, it, it's going to absolutely affect it, and we've looked at a few. It seems like in the sand hills where there is some center pivots and they're, and they're irrigating in those, those big valleys, you know, between the dunes, they're already so flat they don't really have to land level. So I think just the pumping of the water going up and down is not going to have an effect. If they have to land level, yes. One minute. Yes, you had a question, ma'am? No? One minute. Thanks, Aaron. She asked about animal activity from ranches. Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, cattle trails, a mixed blessing. Cattle trails are how we find sites, but they're also tromping around sites. So there is a lot of, there are a lot of cows out there. Uh, generally though, they don't, because there's such a vast area, they will walk along trails, but it's not like there's, you know, they're impacting a big area. I think what really impacts them is rodents. I mean, that site and a lot of others are really rodented up. There's a guy waving, telling me to shut up, I think. So I'm done. Thank you. If you have any more questions, I'll be around for a few minutes.